All right, so I'm here to talk about Zephyr I3C. So what I'll be giving today is I'll just be going over a brief I3C overview. As I imagine most people here aren't familiar with I3C, then I'll talk a bit about how I3C is used within Zephyr. And I'll talk about how the future of I3C within Zephyr. All right, so I'll begin with just a brief overview. So first thing I wanna get out of the way is just sort of the new terminologies with I3C and I2C. So there are terms master and slave, so now the terms are controller and target, and this is now written in the specification. And also um, I2C did get a specification update for these new terminologies as well. All right, so I3C, it's not a typo, <laughs> that is a three. So there is um, some differences. So this does use sort of the same SDA, SCL pins as as I2C, but there are a little bit of differences here. Probably the biggest thing that you'll notice is the bus speed. So the bus speed in I2C typically goes up to one megahertz. There are faster modes as well, but I3C can get up to 12 and a half megahertz for the standard data rate. There's even high data rate modes, such as double data rate, which is the most common, which is about 25 megahertz. And there's even a ternary mode, which is about 33 megahertz as well. So for I2C, typically the pull-up resistors are external. So for I3C, typically they're built into the pad of the controller. <clears throat> so physical signaling, along with the higher speed that I3C uses, this does require it to be in sort of a push-pull mode when possible. And addressing, so I2C has static addressing. I3C, the addresses are a bit more dynamic where they are assigned upon initialization. So interrupts, like for, let's say you have a sensor, an accelerometer, typically you have like a data ready pin, for example, and that does require additional IO on your processor. So for I3C, there's something called in-band interrupts, or basically the interrupt sort of happens in line on the, S, on the data lines that a device can give. So I3C can also support hot, hot joining as well. So device can be plugged in or powered off and get assigned its address. There's also even common command codes that is more of a standard way of communicating with devices. So I want to talk about the terminology as well because I know when I try and teach people I3C, some people get a little confused on the terminology. So. There's three terms for a controller. There's primary controller, secondary controller, and active controller. So primary controller is the, um, this is the I3C controller that upon power on, it acts as the authority and configures all the target devices. So in the initial state, this is the first active controller. So a secondary controller, these typically act as targets upon their first um, power on. But these can also accept the controller role from any active controller. And um, once it becomes the new active controller, it can then pass it back to the previous active controller or onto any other controller capable device on the bus. So an active controller, this can only be one on the bus at a time, but this is the I3C device that presently has control of the I3C bus. And also there are devices that are just target only. So, this is maybe what you're all familiar with. It just can either respond to common or individual commands from a controller. So there's even more terminologies here with addressing. So we have dynamic addresses, which these are the addresses that are assigned or initialization for who to respond to what. And typically priorities and priority is encoded with these addresses as well. So, and, op and there are also two optional addresses that devices may support. A device can have a static address. This is basically similar to what you'll see for an I2C device. Some devices may also support I2C as well, and they will typically use that static address for their I2C mode. There's also group addresses, which is a, um, came with the I3C version 1.1 specification. So basically, this is a separate address from dynamic address where basically a controller can assign a group address to like a group of sensors or a group of cameras, for example. So that way, um, messages can be written all at one time to multiple devices. So the bus is pretty much very similar to how you see I2C. 
um, is also backwards compatible with I2C targets. So an I2C target can't exist on an I3C bus. Um, all right, so in I3C, there are common command codes as well. So these are a standardized set of commands. So some are mandatory, some are conditional, some are optional. A lot of times if you read the data sheet of like your sensor that you're working with, they'll typically have a table listed of the supported common command codes. And they can also be like broadcasted to all devices on the bus, and some can also be directed to a single device as well. And also, um, every I3C device should have a provisional ID. So this is the uniquely identifiable ID that is used to, to identify the device during address assignment. And there is sort of a, a bit mask for how things are set within it that define like the manufacturer ID, which MIPI will assign for it. There's even more of the vendor fixed values that define like the part ID, the instance ID, which sometimes may be come from pinstrapping of the device as well. All right, so in-band interrupts. This is probably the feature most people see with I3C. So there are three types of IBIs, but probably the most common one when people just say IBIs is the target interrupt request. So let's say if I have an accelerometer connected and basically an event happens, like I have accelerometer data ready, for example, the target will then broadcast its dynamic address on the bus and along with possibly a mandatory data byte and even a payload which could describe what kind of event is happening. So when that happens, the controller receives that, um, receives that IBI and it should handle it accordingly, which I'll talk in the future slides. So there's even hot join as well where it broadcasts the address to, which is a reserved address basically that says hey a device either powered on or is plugged in i need an address it's up to the um the active controller to then assign it a dynamic address and also controller handoffs also happen in the in-band interrupts where basically a secondary controller is requesting to become the active controller it's still possible for a active controller to refuse this handoff as well so there has to be some sort of state for making sure that you want to retry later or figure out what you should do in that case. So I3C also has a little another difference from I2C is that the ninth data bit. So with I2C, that ninth data bit was typically an ACK and NAC for, so for reads, it was used to tell the target when the read has ended and for writes, it was just used for an acknowledgement of transfer. So with I3C, this is called the T-bit, which stands for a transitional bit. So for reads, this gives the target control of when the transmission ends. So the target has control of when data should, when it will stop transmitting data. And that's called the end of data bit. So it can either say like not end of data and it will continue transmitting data or just as end of data. And that tells the controller, okay, I'm, this is the end of the packet. It's still possible for a controller to like abort the transfer in the middle of a transaction if the target keeps sending it more data and more data than like a buffer could allow. But for writes, that T bit is used as a parity bit. <clears throat> All right, so now I'll talk a bit about how the Zephyr is typically used with I3C. So there are currently some, a lot of headers within there that sort of define the um, APIs and helpers within there. Um, so there's a, like a common command code helpers that defined all the standard common, com common command code macros and all the defines that come with it. There's even some device tree specific macros for I3C, which I'll get into later. There's even address related helpers, which help with um, assigning it, well, looking up what free addresses are available to assign to uh, an I3C device. There's even I3C target device support as well. So I3C and device tree, um, this is kind of a little confusing because it's quite different than how I2C. So typically with I2C devices, you have the reg, which just shows off your static address. 
But for I3C, this is quite a bit more. So the second, the second, the first element is still the static address if it has one. Of course, static address is optional. So if it doesn't have a static address, then those are to be zero. And the second element is just the upper bit, is, is the upper 16 bit of the 48 bit PID. So you'll typically find that within your data sheet of the part that you're working with. And the third element is just the lower 32 bit of this provisional ID. And also I2C devices need to be defined in let's say some of a unique way as well. So just like before, the first entry of the static address is, um, uh, sorry, the first, the, first, um, the first reg entry is just a static address of the device. And the second element is always zero. Um, there's a bit under the hood magic with the macros to determine that this is an I2C device by knowing that second element is zero. And the third element is actually something new with, L with I3C for compatibility mode called the legacy virtual, v legacy virtual register. So basically, um, when you're in this compatibility mode, this does sort of affect sort of the timing of, of certain, um, <clears throat> of when you toggle the data lines. And I don't have time to get into the, the details of all that, but basically, you need to find this, and this does sort of change how your I3C control will, will be configured. So basically, the, um, the upper three bits define if it has a spike filter and if it is max L, uh, SCL clock frequency tolerant. And the fourth bit just sort of defines if it supports fast mode plus or if it's just a fast mode only device as well. So it knows, so this is sort of used when it's broadcasted out to other devices to know what speed it can support. Okay, so all I3C devices have this descriptor struct within it. So basically under the hood, this gets put into a single E linked list. And this basically is contained within the driver data of the controller. So basically, this does contain the device pointer for the device itself, along with the bus pointer as well. And this does contain all the um, required and optional standard I3C data within it. So it has the constant PID, the constant static address. You can even, um, in a device tree, you can even request an initial dynamic address. And there is some priority encoded with that, so you may want to think about it a bit, as well as the current dynamic address, um, group address, as well as standard control registers within it as well. Okay, so as I showed earlier, the struct I3C device does also contain the, um, oh, sorry, the struct, I, the struct I3C device descriptor is looked up through the I3C device find. So when you want to retrieve that pointer to the device struct, um, all the I3C API has is I3C device find. So you pass the bus device along with the device ID. And this device ID is just the PID, which you read um, from the device tree with the macro below. So you read that ID, you then pass it into this API here, and you'll get, well, hopefully it's found. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll get a null pointer of the I3C device descriptor. And once you have that device descriptor, um, unlike I2C a API, the bus dove is not needed for private transfers because, well, it's already in that. It's kind of redundant. You've already got in that device descriptor. So you pass in that device descriptor as you use instead of the, just the bus contained with it in it. So however, the, some of the I3C APIs that are broadcasted still use the struct device pointer. So if you're broadcasting a common command code, for example, you still use the same bus. Or if you're doing a, the more specific common command code, dynamic address assignment, which has a lot of special stuff around it, then you just pass the same bus pointer with that as well. So, and for, um, <clears throat> for target interrupt requests, so, if I'm like working on an accelerometer or sensor, I need to have some way of basically getting back the um, sort of having a way to be called into for like, let's say accelerometer data ready or gyros gyroscope data ready, for example. So when a controller receives an IBI TIR for a target, it will then enqueue the request into a work queue. 
And so it is up to the device driver for the target to, so, to set up its own function pointer. So it should get its own device struct and then write to that um, IBI callback function, which will then be called back, for example, like, okay, I got my gyroscope data is ready. Go out and call the function to then go out and read the registers for gyroscope. So, and there is target support as well. So if you're acting as a target and um, you want to issue like a hot join request, a TIR or a controller handoff, then that is the IBI raise function. And you, there's a struct where you need to find the IBI type, hot join, controller handoff, or, um, or the uh, target interrupt request as well. So target interrupt request can also come with a payload as well that is sent out to the um, sent out to the controller if it accepts the IBI. So there is also backwards compatibility with I2C. So this, there was a lot of debate on how to implement this, and it is kind of a little silly, but it's kind of the only way to get it to work is basically the I2C driver is just nested within the I3C driver API. And um, this does allow for all existing I2C APIs to be used as is. So that means all the entry GPIO expanders, entry sensors, or external ADCs can be used as is with just an I3C device controller. All right, so there's even um, sort of a helper function in here. So when a primary controller has finished initializing, there is an I3C bus in it within I3C common.c. And this just sort of handles sort of the common code between each driver so we're not duplicating code in multiple places. So basically, this will reset all the devices on the bus. There's a common command to do that as well as resetting the, the dynamic addresses for everything so we get everything back to a known state, as well as disabling events. So basically, events are just IBI. So this basically makes sure that, okay, I'm about to begin initialization. I wanna make sure no one tries to issue IBIs, tells you know all devices to be quiet because I don't want someone trying to interrupt me while I'm trying to perform initialization. So some devices will have static addresses. So there is sort of a, another common command code for assigning dynamic addresses from the static address. Well, basically, hey, I want static address. I want to, wait, I want to have um, who has static address like 64 to have dynamic address 32, for example. And basically it, it checks through its own list. Um, okay, did every device has a static, static address get assigned? Okay. That moves on to the next stage, which basically enters dynamic address mode. So this is something that's required by all devices. So even devices that do not have static address, well, basically this sends out a broadcast saying, hey, anyone need a dynamic address? If it gets an ACK, then it's up to the, um, up to the, um, up to the target to then broadcast its BCR, DCR, and PID. And there is some arbitration within there as well. Well, basically the one who has like the smallest number of all those combined will win first and get the dynamic address. And then that broadcasts the, um, the dynamic address again. Okay, anyone else need an address? Okay, someone else tries to win arbitration. Okay, assign another address. Okay, broadcast again. Oh, I got a neck. That means no one else is there. Okay, and so then once that's done, it then ret retrieves all the device info for device devices. So this include like the max read length, the max write length, for example, of a device. Um, also retrieves the, um, the BCR, the DCR, which I'll get in more into later, as well as PIDs, and there's even some additional data within there as well. Once that's done, it should then re-enable all, all, all I3C events so people can now talk now. The controller is finished with um, finished with initializing the bus. All right, so I'm going to talk a bit about the bus character bus characteristics register. So this is something required by all devices. So when this is read by the controller, this sort of lets the controller know how it will act on the bus and what it can do. 
So the two most significant bits define sort of the role it can do. It will say, hey, I'm only a target, or it can also be, hey, I'm a target, but I'm also controller capable. Um, I may ask for, you know, bug control of the bus later, possibly. There's even advanced capabilities bit. This will define if it supports like, let's say, high data rate modes, for example, um, multiple group addresses. Um, there's quite a lot within there that they just add within the new version. Um, there's also IBI payload. This defines if it is capable of issuing an IBI. Um, there's even another bit that will define if the IBI will come with a payload that will contain data with that as well. And also, um, some devices may have a max data speed limit. So if there is a limitation, it's then up to the controller to go out and read what's your max speed, for example, which can be 10 megahertz, 8, 4, or 2 megahertz. And it's up to the controller to then make note of that when it's addressing it. So for I3C device drivers, um, <clears throat> it is to contain with its provisional ID, which is, you know, read with the I3C specific device, device tree macros, and also contain the bus and the pointer to its own device descriptor, because you want to read it once, and you, you, then you use that for doing the I3C transfers. So it's, so when it's during the initialization functions of these sensors, for example, it's up to the de device to basically find its I3C device descriptor at runtime. So you have the bus, the device ID you read in the, um, that should be in your de device config. And then you should go get the um, I3C device descriptor, which you, then should be stored within the device data. All right, so the extra I in I3C should not stand for inaccessible, <laughs> but there is currently like, let's say not a few, not too many driver support, but there are like new devices coming out that do support I3C. So I believe NXP, the RT600 and RT500s do already have I3C support, and this is with NXP. There's even the more like, let's say, design fab houses like Synopsis and Cadence, which you'll typically use with FPGAs that do have um, I3C support. Um, there was just one actually published uh, last week <laughs> for the NPCXs, which is currently under review. Um, Synopsis does design where I3C, there's currently like three um, pull requests to get that review then merged in. Um, hopefully that will get merged in someday. And even STM32H5s also is a newer family of um, SOCs that, do has, that does have I3C within it. There's just no Zephyr driver yet. But from what I see on Discord, there is someone trying to work on that right now, and hopefully there'll be a PR soon. And I was sort of going through the list a few days ago. I believe there is also an NRF controller that is sort of experimental that will have I3C support. So for device support, um, most of these are sensors. So like accelerometers, gyroscopes. Um, there's even some current um, Zephyr drivers that do exist that, let's say, that do support I3C, but they don't have that interface implemented. They only have SPI implemented, for example. So basically when someone needs it, <laughs> someone could basically implement I3C support on like a BMI 323, for example. All right. So now a bit about like what could come for I3C. And I know the spec specification, if you find it, like is 600, 700 pages about, or is it 400? There isn't everything implemented within I3C, within Zephyr yet, and not everyone has quite used everything yet, but I'm sure that will come soon. So shell support. Um, <laughs> this is probably the most easiest one to get done. I do have an open PR to basically give shell commands for I3C. This is very useful for if you're developing like a controller, you want to test something, or I have like, let's say a new device I'm trying to bring up. I want to like, let's say, do arbitrary reads and writes of registers, or I want to just send a common command code, for example, to read some arbitrary value within it. Um, there's also uh, high data rate modes for, uh, for um, that aren't quite fully supported yet. So there is high data rate, double data rate is probably the most common 
high data rate mode that you'll see. And this does, let's say, have a sort of a standard format that does contain like a preamble, a parity within it, a um, addresses, and even a CRC within it that's defined within a certain way. So basically there could be, um, there are 2B macros in the future to help assist with this to just get the commonality between all devices. So, and some devices do require the firmware to be responsible for the CRC, where it has to like read the payload, calculate the CRC at runtime. But I believe other I3C controllers do that within hardware for you. <laughs> but this could also be implemented within the Zephyr CRC subsystem. It's actually the same CRC5 that USB uses as well. All right, so I know I did mention earlier that there is a a um, controller handoff within IBI, but currently no one implements it. And there's even, let's say, some additional work to get that working as well. As if I'm a secondary controller and the primary controller just assigned everyone the address, you know, how does the secondary controller know what was out there, who got what address? I, the secondary controller should not be changing addresses to something it knows. So basically, this would require modifying some of the Zephyr common code to send out a common command code called define targets at the end of bus initialization or when someone is hot joining the bus. And basically what this would do is inform all the secondary controllers of the device on the bus with their current dynamic address, the PID, the BCR, and DCR. And it would be up to the, um, the secondary controller to match the PID, like, oh, this is that sensor I want to talk to. It has that PID. This is its dynamic address. That's what I use to talk with it. And it's also used to define I2C devices on the bus as well, along with its legacy virtual register within it. Okay, so I, I3C also supports something interesting as, excuse me, as well, called timing control. So basically, if I have a gyroscope or an accelerometer, it's kind of important to know like for some algorithms to know the timestamp of when that occurred. And previously, some people would use like the rising edge of like a data ready pin to know when it happens. But well, if you're using IBIs, then you don't have that, that pin. And plus, if it's an IBI, you don't know when that device could win arbitration of the bus or the bus may be busy. And a, that IBI comes out much later than the actual sensor time. So basically what timing control is, is basically it's a way of broadcasting the, um, the timestamp of when that time occurred. So all devices should have its own internal counter basically, as well as the controller has its own clock frequency, which is used to correlate the two times with one another. So basically the controller needs to understand, okay, what's the clock frequency it uses for this counter, sets the get X time, and that also would enable the timing control and that gets its clock frequency, and then uses that to correlate the sample times to its own clock frequency in order to cal calculate the actual sample time of the event. All right, so I3C and I2C routing MUX devices. Um, currently, th there are a few entry I2C MUXs, and it is a little, let's say, difficult to get that working on with the device tree macros. There are, let's say, some, some ugly hacks just to make it just work. Um, I've had to do it myself. I think I've heard other people had to do it as well. Um, this also does present an issue down the road about how basically a MUX and even routing devices could have its own set of dynamic addresses. So basically it needs to take into account like, okay, I need to assign the specific dynamic address, addresses are free on this route versus that route. Um, so currently device tree macros do not read past the first level of devices. Um, can be a little bit problematic since um, I3C and I2C devices do get under a children of existing devices. All right, so about that get, get device info as well. So basically there's sort of that common I3C get, get device info, which will basically go through and call all the CCC functions and even write to the the device descriptor for you of all those common codes. So basically there is a bit more that needs to be done, especially with bringing in like high data rate modes, for example. 
So basically what needs to happen is that it needs to do a bit more, like read this BCR bit. If some of these bits are set, that means, up oh, there's more information that needs to be read, such as getting the max data speed limit. Also, it's advanced capabilities as well. So this was something kind of fun I just added recently that I did see um, get published uh, a few years ago. There was actually a USB I3C device class, which is kind of new. Um, although I, I don't know when or if this would even come to Zephyr because I, I don't know if there would be a need for it anytime soon. I don't even know if there's host drivers out there yet. But basically this does sort of allow an interface to expose and configure the I3C function within a USB device. And it was kind of cute what they did in the specification where basically um, all USB devices have, let's just say, a byte that defines what class it is. Like I'm a CDC class, I'm a head class. And what they did for I3C class, the I3C class, they just did a device as 3C as the, the byte identifier, which was available. It was kind of cute. Okay, questions? Thanks for this, Ryan. Um, when you get an IBI and it goes into work queue, or is there only one work queue for this? Or just how, how would you do prioritization? Um, <clears throat> it is in that system work queue. Um, I can't quite recall at this moment how that is prioritized. I think, if I recall correctly, I think there is sort of a K config within there, but I, I think I have to get back to you on that. Hmm? So it seems like. Um I3C in general is a bit of a step up in complexity from I2C from like a protocol level. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I2C devices, at least simple ones like temperature sensors, ultra low power, they're basically not there if you're not using them. Are there like power implications of like the 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 counters on the on the uh, target devices and the time conversions and everything else that the controller is doing? Um, there shouldn't be too much power constraints. And even then, I3C for the amount of joules per bit is a lot lower than I2C, for example, with even the push-pull of it as well. But yeah, it, it typically I3C is going to be lower power um, in the amount of bits you're transmitting, for example. So even when you're doing like high data rate modes, it's even less power because <laughs> you're less power per bit as well. But about that timing clock, um, some devices can be, let's say, offline capable. Um, I didn't talk about that in the BCR, where a device can, let's say, power down and may not always respond to commands, but that just sort of lets it know through that BCR register as well. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, yeah. Just out of curiosity, if it can't always respond to commands, how do you know when it can? Well... <laughs> This should be understood by the controller or the device driver when it can, so. Mm -hmm. So just a question on the, the hot join support. So I guess, you know, in, in Zephyr, we don't really have any hot plugging mechanism, right? Device trees all, all at compile time. Is the idea for that for like power savings since the device can, I guess, be depowered and then hot join the bus at a later date? And then if it can, is there a mechanism for a bus to or for a device to power off and, and leave the bus temporarily, I guess, so it can kind of join and then leave with, with I3C? Um, yeah, there, that is sort of follows along with the off-join compatibility bit. With the off-join compatibility, it should be expected that a device will retain its dynamic address as well. Otherwise, it'll have to go through the whole um, initialization process again to get a new address. Uh, do you foresee I3C uh, becoming a replacement across the board for I2C, or do you think these two standards are going to continue on in parallel for the foreseeable future, especially for um, less complex or lower throughput devices? Um, well, I, I can't really predict the future decades on, but I know more complex devices are moving to I3C as things want to get smaller and lower power. I3C is going to be the better option versus like you know, spy, which can require a lot more pins. 
It does have, you know, backwards compatibility as well with I2C, so any future devices that come out could easily live on the same bus as well. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ryan. Um, yeah, thank you for reviewing my my mux patches on the <laughs> on the upstream. Uh, I just want to ask if I've worked with a lot of I3C devices, and I've noticed that a lot of them kind of don't support the vast majority of like the spec in the sense mm -hmm. that they seem to me like they're just using existing I2C capabilities, but they just added like the higher speed and they just called it a day, no dynamic address assignment, uh, no hot join, interrupt support and stuff like that. And I'm wondering if you've seen that before and uh, if you think that we should push manufacturers and like the groups, for example, like the DDR manufacturers, which is JEDEC, to like have like the whole um, spec supported and um, if that's like an ongoing thing that we're working on if you've encountered. Yeah, um, I know that as you like, let's say reconfigure those IPs, like the die size can be a little bit bigger for some devices and even power constraints as well. But I mean, it, it's really up to the implementer on if they really need like double data rate, because some may just be like a temperature sensor or gyroscope, you're just reading a few bytes at a time, for example. But yeah, I mean, some devices do see even I3C versus I2C, like power constraints and even the higher speed is even like a, a benefit as well. But as far as getting manufacturers to support all the specification, <laughs> Um, even then, some of these IP vendors that will make the, um, that makes sort of the RTL don't even support the full <laughs> configuration of the specification either. But I have seen as time moves on, they do get more of the specification implemented. So, so those people who are like creating those devices have those options to add those in. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get your opinion on the um, coexistence of I2C and I3C devices on the same bus. Um, if, would you think that's a good idea? Basically, if it's a safe idea, because theoretically the concept is great, uh, but you rely on that 15 nanosecond deglitch filter that I2C devices should implement if they are compliant to the spec, which mm -hmm. as we all know may or may not happen. It's up to the vendor to actually make sure it, com it complies to that spec. So. Um, have you seen or do you, do you think there might be interoperability issues in that sense so it would be dangerous to combine devices on the bus? Yeah, that, that is actually written to the specification too. There's different like mixed modes and like even a, a pure mode as well. Basically you get sort of limitations on the bus as well. Like there's mixed fast mode and mixed slow mode like if the device doesn't have that glitch filter for example. And even then, like if you're in a mixed mode, you can't do some of these like high data rate modes, for example, like you need to have only I3C devices on the bus, um, if, if I'm recalling that correctly as well. Thank you. <clears throat> so what would you say the current market share of uh, peripherals using I2C is? And is it a little bit of a chicken and an egg of microcontrollers being hesitant to fully embrace that, and then the peripherals also being hesitant to embrace it because you don't have micros in embracing it, or is it both kind of across industry a push towards adopting I3C? Um, it, it is kind of a push, but it is gonna take time. I mean, you know, it's a lot of controllers already have I2C, for example, and if you just replace that with an I3C, you, you still retain your I2C support. So you're not like losing anything there as well, even for controllers as well. You can still maintain the, the let's say the for legacy controllers that support I2C just on the same pin with the same controller as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to get started in Zephyr? So what's the best board and the best sensor to just uh, plug and play and try it out? Um, for I3C, um, for off the shelf, there is the, there's a, I know there are the RT600 as well, but I know the, a lot of people love STMs. 
for example. So there's that H5, which I think they do have some, some dev kits you can order. But like I said earlier, there's no driver yet. <laughs> but I believe someone is going to be publishing that soon based on where, because he is saying he is working on on Discord. But as far as sensors, um, there is sort of that list as well. I think if you just Google I3C Cafe, for example, there's someone who has a blog post about current I3C devices as well. Yeah, we need time, so any last questions? If not, thank you, Ryan. All right, thank you all.